Mama, let me bring your old harmonica to you And I'll get out my guitar and we'll play a song for two and Let that music take us back to when I was a kid Take our minds off everything the way it always did And we'll play you all my sunshine and sing amazing grace Stop and catch a breath and let our laughter fill this place And it's too bad the family's not all here to play along But we'll get back together and it won't be very long Come on, Ricky! circle be unbroken you always said it would but we'll meet again someday and feel just like we should when the roll is called up yonder and time shall be no more we'll be shouting and singing precious memory to the Lord we'll play you all my sunshine and sing amazing grace stop and catch a breath and let our laughter fill this place And it's too bad the family's not all here to play along But we'll get back together and it won't be very long sunshine and sing amazing grace. Stop and catch a breath and let our laughter fill this place. And it's too bad the family's not all here to play along. But we'll get back together and it won't be long. We'll get back together and it won't be very long. One more time. We'll get back and it won't be very long. Good morning. Let's stand up and sing the river of God. Set it up, boys. Help this cripple out over here today. <laughs> The river flows and it brings refreshing wherever it goes. Through the valleys and over the fields, the river is rushing and the river is here. The river of God sets our feet a dancing. The river of God fills our hearts with cheer. The river of God fills our mouths with laughter. Oh 
touch it can be revived. And those who linger on this river shore will come back thirsting for Take a minute and greet your neighbor and tell them good morning. I bet there's somebody here you don't know. Can you find them? shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there everybody when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead and crushed shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there everybody when the Before the master from the dawn to set him sun, let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over, our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is 
is caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder i'll be there when the roll when the roll called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there you may be seated you did sing that song growing up anybody all right You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. And I will sing again. You are so good to me. You heal my broken heart. You are my Father in heaven. You are so good to me. You heal my broken heart. You are my Father in heaven. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. And I will sing again. You ride up on the clouds. You lead me to the truth. You are the spirit inside of me. You ride up on the clouds, you lead me to the truth, you are the spirit inside me. You are beautiful, you are beautiful, you are beautiful, you are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. I will sing again to the beat. You are my strong melody. You are my dancing rhythm. You are my perfect rhyme. And I will sing with you.
it, that's the problem when it's a, all, all, everybody. It's a string band. We all, we all just give us a minute. We'll be ready. Good old Nate Deering over there supposed to have went home with Donna, and Donna went home, and he said he's staying here to play. That's how strong our love is. That's right. Hey, I've been married 50 years. Come on. That's, that's all right. We're glad you're here. We really are. And uh, the the guitar players to my right are picking up the slack today for me because I'm sort of gimpy. And uh, what you what you see on my face is feeling, but it's not for these songs necessarily. <laughs> that D chord hurts bad. So, oh. Uh, <laughs> Great song right here by Ga Ga Guy Clark, who passed away last week. Good, another great prodigal song as we continue looking at Luke chapter 15 today. Standing on the gone side of leaving found her thumb and stuck it in the breeze She'll take anything that's going close to somewhere She can lay it down and live it like she please She ain't going nowhere, she's just leaving She ain't going nowhere, she can't breathe she ain't going home, and that's for sure. She's not sitting and crying on her suitcase. She has no second thoughts by the road. She's got feelings that need some repairing. And she don't give a damn that it shows. She ain't going nowhere, she's just leaving She ain't going nowhere, she can't breathe in She ain't going home, and that's for sure away with her hair and the blues have a way with her smile and she has a way of her own like a prisoner has a way with a file she ain't going nowhere she's just leaving she ain't going nowhere, she can't breathe in. She ain't going home, and that's for sure. She ain't going nowhere, she's just leaving. She ain't going nowhere, she can't breathe in. She ain't going home. She ain't going home, and that's for sure. She ain't going home, and that's for sure.
Meanwhile, back at the ranch. That's one of the great cowboy phrases of all time. Not to mention the song written by, written by Gordon Kennedy, our own Brian Kennedy's older brother. But in the olden days of the silent cowboy movies, this was a placard that would be shown on the screen to move the action from maybe the saloon in town to the action back at the homestead. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you can just feel the anticipation, the what's going to happen now. And I know exactly where the phrase originated. It's from Luke chapter 15, verse number 25. (laughs) Near the end of this blockbuster chapter about lost sheep and lost coins and a lost prodigal son who finally comes home, everything is well and good as it should be, and the credits are just about to roll to this happy ending. And we pick up the reading at verse 25. You have it in your text there today. What's that first word? Oh, you know it's ruined now. (laughs) We just welcomed the prodigal son home. They've just had this huge party started. Champagne champagne bottles are popping and glasses tinkling. People are eating ribs. (laughs) Mm. Maybe Willie Nelson's on the radio. Meanwhile, mm, the older brother was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And so he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never even gave me a one young goat for a feast with my friends. And yet when this son of yours, not my brother, notice that, (laughs) this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes. That hasn't come up in the story yet, but apparently that's what was going on. You celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And we're going to stop right there for today. If only Luke 15 had ended at verse 24. That verse that ends with such joy, it's not printed for you, but the text says, and so the party began. Hallelujah. That's where we want all stories to end. But no, no, no. Not everyone is happy about this little turn of events. Not everyone is ready to pop those champagne bottles and raise a toast to letting bygones be bygone. Remember how the story of the prodigal son begins. It begins like this. A certain man had two sons. The younger one is back home under the father's roof now And where is the second? I should say, where is the first? Because this is the older son. And he is where good sons are always found. Working his father's field. He is on the job. He is being responsible. He is taking initiative. He is doing what needs to be done. It's those baby children at the end of the line that are so irresponsible. Just kidding, just kidding. I was just seeing if it would get a reaction there, but anyway. But I can see him coming in at the end of a long day. He's been out in the heat and in the sun. And what does he find going on? It's a party. And that's cool. So he parks the tractor in the barn and he uncouples the hay baler and he steps around and pulls his boots off because his feet are so sore. He's been working from dawn to dusk, takes a long drink of water, washes his sunburned face off, calls some of the help over and says, hey, what's going on at the house? And the servant says the obvious, man, you won't believe it. Your brother came home. Oh, hell no. (laughs) He won't even go inside. I'm going to do my best to finish this story next week. 
I know we're laboring in it, but it's really good. I don't care if you like it or not. It's inconsequential <laughs> at this point. It's a great story. It's the greatest story ever told. And we'll see Jesus make his final point next week with a very fine, sharp edge. But today I have to defend the older brother. I have to a little bit. We'll smack him around next week. But today we're going to defend him. Because we have to understand how he feels. We have to give him a little room to breathe here. Because this is hard, hard, hard to take. And besides that, I know something about this guy. And some of you do. I know how he feels. I am him in more ways than one. And I'd like to tell you a story today, if I could. A story about an older brother. And it could be for you, some of you, a story that sounds strangely like your own. Because you may not identify so much with the prodigal. You've never really strayed that far from home. And if that's you, then with me, you might be standing in the older brother's shoes. I am the oldest son, literally, in my own family. And like this young man in Jesus' story, I could always be found in the field, on the job, working hard, doing what is right. If you needed someone to count on, if you need someone to do it right, then you can call on me. I'll make sure it gets done right. And I've discovered about myself, as I've gotten older, that when I say something like, well, I just want things done right. What I'm actually saying is, I want things done my way. (laughs) My room was always clean. My grades, always straight A's. My car, the oil was always changed and the turtle wax freshly applied. My performance reviews always said, exceeds expectations. I had a few youthful indiscretions along the way, but my nose was clean, my future was bright because I always did the right thing. So you can imagine my surprise when life didn't work out the way that it was supposed to. My way. I went through a divorce, a divorce at 29 years of age when I was the pastor of the big booming Baptist church in town and had already been labeled the next rising star by my denomination, well, that ended. You can't be divorced in a Baptist church and be a rising star. (laughs) I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. Yours may be different. And I kept asking myself, how did this happen? I was doing everything right. Even, Even getting divorced, I wasn't the wrongdoer. I'd kept my vows. I'd been faithful. I was doing what you're supposed to do. And then I took the role of the single dad with these two babies enthusiastically because that was the right thing to do. It was the honorable thing to do. And underneath the surface, I was a volcano of anger. You know what I'm saying? How can my goals and my ambitions be taken away from me when I have done everything according to the plan? And the answer to that question came from a very unexpected place, my own family. (laughs) I am the oldest brother in more ways than one, and one of those ways involves a brother eight years my junior. And I'm telling a story today that I haven't told publicly, but it's common knowledge, so don't think that I'm throwing anybody under the bus. And if you spend any time listening to me over these years, you know that my brother was ill from a very early age, months and months of hospitalizations, and and my mother was by his side, and my father was working multiple jobs to pay the medical bills. My grandmother was very involved in our life, basically raising us during that time, my sister and I. And my brother survived, and he thrived after those earliest years, but his illness set the stage for some major dysfunction in my family. And it's no secret. My parents were overprotective. My parents coddled him. They made excuses for him. When he got in trouble, they always bailed him out because he had been through so much. Until one day they couldn't bail him out. And instead they called me to do that. 
My brother went to jail one afternoon for reasons I'd rather not disclose. And my mother was devastated and called me and asked me to intervene because I am the good son. So I went down to the jail, and they brought my little brother out wearing that orange jumpsuit. And beginning at Genesis 1 and continuing through Revelation 21, <laughs> I preached one of the best sermons of my life. <laughs> Summing up and calling upon all the fire and brimstone of my childhood. And I left it all in that jail cell with him. I vented my frustration about his lifestyle, his choices. I vented my frustration that I had a good name in this town. And now they're going to read in the papers that my brother is in jail. And uh, after I got done, I bailed him out. After I got done. I went out and signed a property bond. It means I put my home and my family and my wife and my children on the line for him. And I said, by God, you had better do what is right and show up at court and keep the, the, the arrangements of your bond or this sermon you've heard today is nothing compared to what I will do to you. Two weeks later, my brother caught a bus to Harehaut, Indiana to meet a girl he had met on the internet. I only thought I had been angry before. <laughs> now I could taste gunpowder in my mouth. I got it together long enough to do a little investigation and discover where he was and when he was coming back. And when he stepped off that Greyhound bus in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I was the one waiting for him. <laughs> Get in the car. And then from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Calhoun, Georgia, it takes 50 minutes. And I preached the second greatest sermon <laughs> of my life. And I carried him to the Gordon County Jail and literally took him by the collar through the doors said, here he is, he broke the bonds of his agreement, and I'm here to take my name off the property bond. He is yours. I took my name off, and I went home. And 20 minutes later, my mother bailed him out of jail. I marched right back over to her house with my proverbial guns ablazing, and I unloaded 30 years of resentment on for their enabling, weak-handed, kowtowing ways. How they had asked me to intervene because I knew how to do the right thing, and when I didn't do it the way they wanted to do it, they went behind my back and did it their way, you filthy cowards. Whew. My blood pressure's up just reliving this today. I went on and on about how I'd always made it on my own, how I had paid for every nickel of my education without them, and because of them, how I had paid my own way even in high school, that I was working 40 hours a week at Walmart in high school and carrying a 4.0, and he couldn't even keep a job. How I had lost everything, my house, my car, my marriage, and my career, and somehow I'd got it all back with no help from them, thank you very much. And you've done everything for him, and you've never lifted a finger to help me. Now, am I getting close to home for anybody in this room? By the time I was finished, babies were crying, dogs were howling at the moon, the neighbors were coming over to see if they could help with anything, my brother had locked himself in the bathroom, my mother's in the fetal position on the floor, and my daddy's standing there saying, yeah, you're right. <laughs> And then my mother said this. Son, we never had to help you because we knew you could make it. Of all our kids, you're the only one who never gave us any trouble. To which I answered, well, you've given plenty of trouble to me. And I slammed the door and went on vacation to the beaches of South Walton. I did, just ask Cindy. And it was healthy to get away. When you get that angry, it is good and right and holy to get away <laughs> from a situation. The book of Proverbs says, Better is he that can control his temper than he that can take a city 
It takes more strength sometimes to keep your mouth shut, and I didn't have it. It takes more strength to keep your mouth shut than to do some great heroic act. So I just left. And I couldn't get away from my rage. Have you ever been that angry? That you can't get away from... You, you get away from the people that might, you think cause it, but you can't get away... It's hard to get away from you. And I should have. I was sitting down here on these... We weren't living here then. I was sitting down here on these beautiful beaches before they were so crowded. And I was <laughs> away from work. And our kids were a joy because they were young then. <laughs> they were little... And Cindy and I had been married not that long. Braden was in diapers. I'd found the love of my life. I was blessed with health and all of this sitting in this beautiful place. And I was still so mad. And I've never told anyone this, not even Cindy. I was sitting on the beach one morning. Cindy was tanning and looking hot. <laughs> the boys were playing. I had this anger on my mind mulling the source of it. And God or the universe or the dolphins just offshore spoke. Because it's hard to tell the difference when you see beautiful. I, maybe that is God speaking. And this is what I heard. You ready? <clears throat> all these years I've slaved for you. And in all that time you never even gave me so much as a goat to share with my friends. I wasn't angry about getting short-changed changed on a goat barbecue. I wasn't angry, really, with my parents. I wasn't even angry at my brother, not really. No more than the prodigal son was actually the object of his elder brother's rage in Luke 15. Who was I angry with? The Father. God. And why? For not being fair. We work. We're faithful. We do what is right. We labor in the field from the dawn to the setting sun. And it doesn't get us anywhere. At least it doesn't get us ahead of the losers. Where is the appreciation, God? Where is the attaboy? Where is the justice where are the fair wages? And that's the lesson. Our relationship with God is not based on wages. There is nothing to earn. It's all grace. That's the lesson. So when we start touting how we have slaved so hard for God, we are exchanging our position as a son or a daughter for a slave. And this God is not interested in slaves. This God wants sons and daughters. And if it's the wandering prodigal who feels like they need to make up for all the mistakes they have made, or if it's the faithful, hard-working older brother and sisters who feels they must continue to earn their place in the family. It doesn't matter. It's slavery when you fall into that trap. And God wants children, not prisoners, held against their will. You see, for every prodigal that has ever tried their own brand of freedom to get away from God, and they've ended up broken and enslaved, prisoners by their own choices, there are just as many of us older brothers who never strayed from home, but we are just as imprisoned. We are compelled by the grinding forces of pride and arrogance and this false sense of superiority, and we wake up one day to discover that all we have been doing for God or all we have been doing for church is fueled by anger and offense, our own woundedness, rather than being fueled by grace and gratitude. And when you are motivated by resentment, you are a prisoner, even if you've never left home. Those of you who are not prodigals, and there are a few of you, 
It was so funny when I started talking about the prodigal son story, Billy turned to me one morning and said, you know, you keep talking about the prodigal, you're going to have to give an altar call in this church. <laughs> well, you, you're probably right, but there's a few of us in here that are the older brothers. Look deep in your own heart today and ask this question. What is driving me to do what I do? And if you're anything like me, you'll find this incredible reservoir of rage. Because God or life or karma or the fates have not been as fair to you as they should have been. So you keep pressing on, always trying to do the right thing with animosity and bitterness as the constant companions to your good and faithful deeds. You'll hide it with a little sarcasm here and there, a little bravado, and when it gets really bad, you'll play the martyr. That's all I've ever wanted to do. I know these lines. I know all about it. But one day you'll be sitting on a beautiful beach somewhere, Surrounded by more goodness than you have ever deserved. And you'll have that moment to ask, why am I so angry? And God might speak. Wayne Wilson was my next door neighbor when I was a kid. I, don't, I can't wear a watch on this hand, so I might talk for the next two hours. But <laughs> Wayne Wilson was my next door neighbor when I was a kid, and he was this cultish, gangly skinny kid with a huge crop of curly red hair and one day his father Johnny knocked on our door and he said have you seen Wayne we can't find him he's missing Wayne was 10 or 11 I guess then we hadn't seen him so we joined Johnny and Barbara and half the neighborhood went looking for him calling his name and going door to door and a sheriff's deputy came over to file a report and of course in a small town when the law shows up everybody gathers around to see what's going on and we're all standing around this car I'll never forget it and, and the deputy is taking the description red hair okay four and a half feet tall braves t-shirt sort of looks like the boy standing on the porch <laughs> We all turn around. There's Wayne. <laughs> he had this faraway look in his eye. He had crease marks on the side of his face. He had fallen asleep under his bed. <laughs> Lost, but had never left home. That's what we older siblings do. We don't run away to some far away, never land, losing our way and wasting our lives. We stay home. and We do what we are supposed to do. And yet, we can be just as lost and confused and as far away as the most rebellious prodigal in the world. And still, the Father calls us home. All of us. And that is the point of this great story. The father who jumped off the front porch to run to his prodigal is now the father who slips off the back porch to speak to his elder and gives them the same invitation. Come home. And we can. Whether we are regretful prodigals or resentful elders, we can go home as beloved children because that's what we are. Let us pray together. May it be your will, O Lord, that you guide our footsteps toward peace, not only with others, but with ourselves. May you rescue us from the hand of every enemy along the way, even when we find that that enemy is ourself. Grant that all that we may do is blessed and grant us the vision to see the kindness and the mercy that you have shown us all. Hear this prayer, O oh God, in the name of Christ, who calls all God's children home, we pray. Amen.
I invite you to the Lord's table this day. I'm happy to say that today uh, many of the ladies from Path of Grace are here from the Path of Grace home. John and Peggy Crunk, and I'm going to embarrass the Crunks. The Path of Grace would not be what it is and survive these years without John and Peggy pouring their lives into this organization and this recovery process for so many young women in this community. And I want to say both to John and Peggy, thank you. And thank you for letting this church be a small part of that. And I want to say to you ladies here today, you are welcome. Come to this table with us and let us celebrate the gift of God's grace. try to repay all I've taken from you, then maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself on my way back.
so help me Jesus I know what My soul's in your As we pray together today, I, I'm happy to report that I spoke to Kurt and Judy this week, and uh, Kurt is really doing things. Uh, Craig, I'm sorry. I got Kurt, Craig, George, Tom. They're all right here. 
I'm not on pain pills. I will be as soon as I'm done <laughs> here. But thank you, Susan. Craig mm -hmm. and Judy. Craig is doing fantastic with his liver transplant. They uh, they uh, put a they do a few interventions uh, Friday, and Craig got he got a little nervous and upset, thought he was dying, and Judy kept telling him it's fine, everything's no well. They're talking about him being out in just days, so he is just absolutely fantastic. So uh, prayers for them over there in Jacksonville. Uh, pray for uh, George Davenport, and George is indestructible, <laughs> but he's having back surgery coming up soon. So uh, our prayers are, are with you and uh, many other requests. Kurt has asked that uh, I share with you uh, an announcement for Tuesday, Brian Kennedy and Friends, which includes Force Williams, this Tuesday evening, May 24th, at the B Hibiscus House in the Backyard of Love in Grayton Beach, $15 cover, and food will be available. Music starts at 7. And on June 28th, the backsliders will be there, by the way, filling the spot. So uh, just to let you know, uh, June 28th, I just found that out. Can you do that? We start at 7. Are you be in bed by then? Come in your pajamas. You can go to 8? Okay, good. You got the first set. Then after that, you go to bed. Uh, yes. Caring and sharing. Thank you. Caring and sharing is the charity of choice for this coming Tuesday night. So they, they rotate that around each week. So let's pray together and let's join hands together and continue to pray for our building. Things are coming along splendidly now. We've got our interior permits close to our interior permit. And, uh, and good progress about to be made. And uh, if you haven't seen it, the full exterior is up and we're looking forward to meeting there soon. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your grace to all of us, we who wander in our myriad of ways, sometimes wandering when we don't even leave home. And we ask that you open up our hearts to your love and your grace and see that we are, in fact, beloved children. We have nothing left to prove and nothing left to earn, but only your grace and love to live out and help us to do that. For these many requests that we have mentioned here today, we ask that you be with these that we love and with those who continue to face great battles, that your grace would be abundant in their lives. As Jesus has taught us to pray, we pray boldly. Our Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and sing. This is our offertory. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Everybody! On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky and the roll is called up yonder are we there when the roll last verse here we go let us labor everybody let us labor for the master from that dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Everybody, when the roll. You keep 
singing that chorus. Ricky's gonna get the lead as wind it up there, Ricky. When the road.